Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. learners welcome to this online course on legal language legal including general english this is lecture number 3 and the title of this lecture is legal language in india i am dr divya gupta an assistant professor at gla university mathura today we are going to study about legal language in india in previous two lectures you people have gone through the characteristics of english language along with the uh, history of english language now we are going to deal with the language legal language in india while talking about the drafting how briefs are drafted how case laws are how several uh, like uh, notices are there summons are there summons are there so you will definitely learn how a proper language is used for the transcription of all these legal documents juristic writings so here we are going to discuss uh, several points and along with that i would like to tell you about the legal uh, you should you can say the learning outcomes of this lecture here these are the learning outcomes of this lecture where you would understand that the multilingual nature of legal language in india that so many languages they run together in india right it's not only english but other languages also so here english is there and along with this we have other regional languages in these regional languages you must know that there are 22 regional languages in india and along with that regional language we have the capacity of including few more regional languages by the permission of honorable president of the country the governor of state can include has the potential to include few more legal languages regional languages in his own state with the due permission of the president so in this case 22 are there in the list along with that 30 38 regional languages are still in a queue to be included in that list here i would like to tell you that it is a multilingual country it's a multilingual nature of legal language where many languages are being treated at the same pace at the same level you would be able to appreciate the use of bilingualism i told you english is the most important language of apex court that is supreme court and along with english yes any other language any other regional language could be the source of communication could be the source of transcription along with it you must know that legal drafting styles you will learn the various legal drafting styles may may be talking about the uh, contracts writing the contract citations sometimes by uh, you can say notice if you want to write some kind of like uh, law report any other so i'm going to tell you the drafting style and the uh, language that we are going to use in it there you would be able to analyze the linguistic legislative language of indian statutes you would be able to go through that Yes of course after that you would be able to examine the language used in judicial decisions and judgments so the language used in judicial decisions you learn about them and along with that how cultural and historical factors influence legal language in india how basically the culture social aspect the political aspect they actually influence our country influence our legal language so these are the most important thing where you can definitely work out very well okay so these are the learning outcomes of our lecture that is on basically dealing with the legal language in india specifically talking about india not about any other country so here we are going to go, go on with the content that what are the contents what are the topics that we are going to cover throughout this lecture we are going to go through indian history of legal english first of all i am going to tell you about the indian history where east india company east india company and many other things will come in this category then establishment of east india company 
Further, you will learn that how British settlement at Madras played an important role. How this thing actually played an important role when they set up a business at their own firm at Surat and after that Surat, Madras. So further, these things became a very important part and characteristic features of legal language. You would see those elements of legal language, specific language usage and the most important part is how to draft contracts in the same language, drafts, contracts, li licenses, then indictments. Further, you would talk about subpoenas, then briefs, judgments, laws of parliament, then case laws, case reports, legal correspondence. So, all these things you will learn throughout these lecture. This particular lecture basically is dedicated to the drafting part where how which kind of language should be used in different drafting part. Okay. Uh, yes, so further I am going to take you to the next level where Indian history of legal English is delivered. So, while talking about Indian uh, history, I would uh, definitely touch a little bit of uh, Norman conquest in 1066 when these three When Angel, Saxon and Jutes, they actually these Teutonic tribes, they conquered and they left, they left an indelible impact on the situation on the uh, British Isle. At that time, this Norman conquest actually brought about a change in the whole scenario and in this condition what happened like French along with Latin, Old English they merged together with Germany also, Germanic tribes were there, so Germanic also. So, these all amalgamation is visualized in Indian legal language also. So, here new language, new words like guilty, swear, witness, etcetera, will, etcetera were used in this new language and they were not actually a part of English earlier, but yes, later on because of the impact of uh, la Latin and uh, French you can say. Vikings, 7500 words still there of French language, yes. So, here we have 7500 words still there in French of French influence and especially talking about Latin influence, yes again we are using Latin uh, maxims, terminologies and uh, references so as to make it more clear. Act of Parliament, the Act of Parliament it uh, came in 1362 and after that basically like the whole system changed and where the East India Company was established. This East India Company was established and 31st December 1600 was by the charter of Queen Elizabeth. Then the governor and the company of merchants of London trading into West Indies, they were trading into West Indies and, and through that way it came into being legislations, court of directors, one governor and 24 directors. So, that was the whole combination, the whole uh, like uh, you can say composition of the legislature part. Then we have legislative powers of East India Company, made laws and ordinance for servants and imposed fines on penalties. So, here it was able to like you were able to find the uh, laws ordinance, law and ordinance for servants and impose fines, this is very important, right, for servants and fines. Then the starting of uh, King's Commission came. Now what is King's Commission? King's Commission, I should say that King's Commission, now this King's Commission Indian officer, often written as KCIO right were introduced introduced in 20th century 20th century under the indianization process process so king commissioned indian officer was an indian officer of the british army indian officer of the britain british army who was sent basically to UK for the training, for the training of arms and armaments, for the training of artillery, for the training, different types of training where 
they were skilled they were made skilled to be a part of british army and thereafter like this king's commission became an integral role played an integral role when king's commission after training after training actually those people after training those indians and where they used to send them to you to uk and basically at several places royal military royal military college then we have sandhurst sandhurst infantry officers then woolwick woolwick for artillery for artillery officers so these are three venues where people were sent from india for training so what was that the royal one the royal military college second we have sandhurst sandhurst infantry uh, officers then we have woolwick for artillery practices so these this is what king's commission is all about the king's commission is all about training them training indians to be a part of british uh, like art, uh, british army this is how the whole system initiated now there was a demand of british settlement at madras when this british settlement became uh, very dominant at madras what happened madras 1639 to 1726 now in this condition factory uh, factory at masoli patnam under the ages of surat company was set up ages is under the shelter of surat company was established 191639 now in 1639 masoli patnam took permission to construct a factory titles as fort st george so masoli patnam it took the permission in 1639 to set up another factory another factory titled as fort st george and with that establishment of this what happened they tried to overpower india and with that overpowering indians basically what happened the system also sweeped into or penetrated into their art their languages their system their culture their traditions they penetrated into the whole system so white town versus black town is a very uh, common example when it when people tried we when people faced the opposition between uh, black and white at that time and obviously there was a uh, untouchability also prevailing at that time so gradually the whole system like was annexed the cultural social political aspect was was annexed by these britishers that is the how, that is how like entire thing got into their uh, hands and the influence also went on so first phase you can see 1639 to 1665 civil and criminal cases were handled by council coltry court was established to resolve these cases of madra so uh, yes madras patam adhigar is the headman of the court petty civil and criminal cases so for petty criminal uh, civil cases basically adhigar was there and that adhigar used to resolve all the petty small level civil laws civil cases and sometimes criminal cases also so at that time in the first phase 1639 to 1635 1665 sorry so in during this time period what happened like this particular time span individual adhigars were made and civil and civil and criminal cases were sought out or resolved at a very lower level further in the second phase what and one more thing that pedadiyan was the subordinate to of adhigar next we in the second phase what happened 1678 to 1686 now here we are going to uh, they they established they st uh, fixed up hired the strashism governor of master jury of 12 members in this condition jury of 12 members were there now that the court is designated with the high court of judicature high court of judicator was given and then adhigars were replaced with pay masters now adhigars were given the like uh, were replaced were changed with the pay master like this individual salary was given to them 
and they used to resolve all kind of criminal and civil cases. So, mint minister, mint master and custom master. So, pay master, mint master and custom master. So, these three masters were replaced, were replaced by adhigars. This is the whole system of law which actually started and changed the whole scenario of India. Now, in third phase what happened in 1686? Now, in 1686 to 1726, Admiralty Court, John Biggs, a new judge, Dolber, 86 to 89, just for two years, just for three years I should say, establishment of cooperation, 1688, first May or ninth elderman. Now, in this condition, for one mayor plus nine eldermen, seven Englishmen and two any nationality. So, that was the establishment of the whole, the, the constitution of the entire uh, like uh, judges along with the other people. So, what were they? One mayor would be there and nine elder men would be there. Out of those nine, seven would be English and two would be of any nationality. Okay. So, that is how people started uh, involving uh, Britishers also like you can say the people from English, from England, people fr uh, from the other uh, like countries to be a part of our legal system. Now, establishment of mayor's court, 1726, uh, one mayor and two eldermen. So, now when mayor court was established at that time, it became very essential and it actually laid a foundation to this point when one mayor was there along with two eldermen. Now, in this condition, this is the third phase. Now, in this condition, this is the whole thing where I should say the entire system changed and it came into the hands of Britishers, clear? Now we will see that how Latin and French influence, French influence will definitely make a change in the system, in the entire transcriptions by talking about the characteristic features, by talking about the scope of English uh, like uh, you can say language in India, then we can talk about the uh, drafting methodologies each and every point at each and every point. So, here you will learn that how system changed with the passage of time. Now, I would like to take you to the characteristic features of legal language. When it comes to characteristic features of legal language, yes, you must know about precision and specificity. Avoidance of ambiguity by not adding too many legal maxims, yes, it could be made less ambiguous. Further, use defined terms, formality, sometimes use of legalese. Legalese, again the legal maxims. Here you understand this part that this is avoidance of colloquialism by giving too many references and avoiding day to day language in legal writings. So, this thing happened when people started using more of Latin expressions, but less making it less ambiguous along with thinking it to keep his language aloof from colloquial style, day to day style of writing. In this condition, clarity is the most important characteristic features of our legal language, clarity. Because once it will be talking about clarity, obviously you must think about the, uh, about reducing the ambiguous side and making it com concise. So, use a standard sentence structure, not no complex sentences. If they are complex sentences, try to break them, break down, break them down into simple, clear into simple sentence. Clear organization and formatting. Formatting we learn by drafting a side where you will understand that how drafting could be done accordingly. Remember, so here these are the characteristic features of legal English. Along with that you would learn the elements of legal language. What are the elements? What is preamble? If I talk about preamble, it is a legal document. You must remember, it is a legal document typically written typically begin with a preamble. Each and every legal document actually begins with a preamble. 
and what you must know about this preamble that sets out the background the background and purpose and purpose of the document of the document right so this is what preamble is preamble is a kind of introduction to any legal document and it is always written before the legal uh, any legal document that you write that is preamble so preamble is the first important element of all legal language all legal writing you must learn how to write the preamble so what does it have the introduction to that thing and the parties involved how many parties are involved in that so all these things will come in the part of preamble then further we are going to talk about the definition part in this condition the definitions key terms concepts avoiding vagueness avoiding irrelevant ideas avoiding irrelevant ideas then you must know about the operative progressive provisions stipulations sometimes requirements obligations and rights you must talk about the remedies sometimes you must talk about the remedies when it comes to remedy part you must know that these decisions that you are coming up solutions that you are coming up they are actually the important element of legal language which kind of like language you are using in that giving the resolution giving the verdict by the judge so you must know about them further you must talk about the penalties and enforcement penalties and enforcement dispute resolution mechanism like whatever the verdict uh, like the court or the judge is giving so these will come in the element of language legal language further you may come up to the specific language usage we use a specific type of language or specific paragraphs specific there, where of there of after here so these kind of legal maxims could be used to make this word concise precise and cogency so it gives these three features it adds three features to our writing if i if we are using legal maxims in it latin maxims in it so commonly used latin phrases and their significance in legal documents so what are these legal documents that we are talking about in this condition you must know that legal documents that uh, you should know are several uh, like if i say case laws are there then we have uh, regulations we have regulations we have contract we have notice summons like this yeah so what is statutory language is that statutory language is statutory language is something related to the references to relevant laws that means the leg regulations incorporating legal standards and in that condition you must know about this thing incorporating legal standards and conditional language what is the conditional language for example using shall may must conveying legal obligations in this condition for example if i say the parties the parties shall meet annually annually the party shall meet annually to review the agreement right so this this clearly the sentence the party shall meet regularly in order to view the agreement in this condition you very easily get to know that shall is used to indicate the condition okay so in that condition you must know how you can change the scenario how you can bring about uh, the the important element highlighted when you talk about the condition further if i am going to talk about the statutory languages yes this one is really important when it comes to statutory languages yes let me write down here legal language legal language in india frequently frequently references specific laws specific laws sections 
under section so and so that we write and regulations and regulations. It is common to cite prevalent relevant provisions of acts, of codes, of or statutes to clarify the to clarify legal framework. So, basically statutory language is telling the uh, references sometimes legal pre uh, precedences, sometimes telling about the sections under section uh, under act this, under section this, under uh, like clause A, clause 1, so sub clause A. So, whatever you talk about over here, ye, that will be the statutory language that you are using with da datas, with figures, with all the relevant details. So, with this we are going to move further to case law and precedents. Now, in case law and precedents, you must know about the citation of legal cases. I would like to draw your attention towards your towards the citation part. When it comes to citation, remember in my uh, uh, yes, in uh, other lectures also, like I have uh, told that by using blue book, you all can understand and definitely go through the exact citation methodology. Okay, and for the time being, I would definitely tell you how to cite. What are the important elements of citing? Now, citing a legal case in that condition, let me tell you over here that when it comes to citation, you must know that case name will come first. Case name, then year, court, number, then we have year and volume, report report abbreviation, abbreviation first page. So, here this is the whole scenario where you can definitely draft or create or create the citation. How are you going to create the citation that I told you? First of all, you are going to write down the case name, then you are going to talk about the year. After that year, you must know about the court, court which handled that case then number then again year volume report uh, abbreviation sometimes and then first page so how are you going to draft it in a casual manner if i'm going to take the real life example of uh, the form and one person for example if i say cor thomas cor was the person versus i b c vehicle this is the name of the case limited 2008 UKHL, UKHL stands for United Kingdom House of Lords. So, whichever court is actually handling it, House of Lords, UKHL 13, 2008, year again I told you, 1 AC. 884. So, this is the case actually Mr. Kaur breach of duty, Mr. Kaur's Kaur actually committed suicide. Due to employers breach of duty under section 1 sub clause 1 of the 1976 act. Now, this is the case basically of Mr. Kaur who committed suicide, it is a real case Mr. Kaur who committed suicide because of the employers. Uh, duty breach of duty in that condition and under that condition like under section under section 1 sub clause 1 of the 1976 act this case was filed by his wife and in that condition uh, but finally what happened the jurisdiction was uh, the verdict was different and the decision was not taken in his favor 
but still I would like to tell you that in this condition you must know that by this methodology you can cite any case, any legal case in that condition. So, am I being very clear everyone my dear learners? Whenever you try to cite any example or cite any kind of uh, you can say any uh, additional point or uh, references of any case law, references of any hearing, any, any legal precedents or any general article, then definitely there are different methodologies. I have referred, yes you must refer blue book for that purpose, but please be very particular about all these things. So yes, with this note I am going to move further where I would certainly or maybe uh, just, uh, uh, just uh, re-revise everything that uh, citations are done, quotations and references are done from past judgments and analysis, commentary and analysis. So here I have already explained how to do that. Then we are going to talk about drafting techniques. Now these are very important because after that only we would be applying all those techniques in our drafting part. Drafting in contract law, drafting in notice, drafting in sum summons, drafting in law agreements. So everything we will see one by one. But one you have to understand the drafting techniques. Drafting techniques on the basis of sub pianas also. So use of legal templates standardized formats for different documents, ensuring consistency and compliance. So, you must use the legal templates. Whatever format is laid down, you must know how to use that format in your writing skill. You cannot actually use, it is not your, uh, your own desire where you can use your creativity and imagination to do that. No, you have to, you have to change, you have to change it accordingly. So, remember whenever there is a legal template, proper legal template should be uh, followed. Here you should avoid redundancy and repetition. So you must know that when it comes to redundancy that means clause, clauses are structured, clauses are structured logically, right, logically to ensure clarity. Now you must know that clauses are structured to ensure uh, clarity. In that condition my dear learners redundant is out of use. Extra usage of those words should be avoided and in that condition specific clauses are made to make sure a structure like special clauses with a proper structure has been logically made to avoid this redundancy. Here reducing interpretation errors like if people are interpreting in a wrong manner we have the set pattern, we have the set interpreted uh, uh, like uh, uh, availability of uh, all these case laws, all these legal precedences on the uh, portals. So yes, drafting will definitely help you out to go on with that. Interpretation and ambiguity is also important like uh, you must focus on proper interpretation and avoid ambiguity. So role of courts in that condition. Now I would like to tell you about the, about the courts if I say, now in that condition how many courts have you heard about? Like if they are, if I talk about there are many courts, Supreme Court, High Court and then we have District Court, sometimes we have others, District and session, sessions court, yes and uh, appellate course, appellate court. For this high court I could say that whatever like how many states do we have, 28 states and 8 union territories. So we do have high courts in each state and union territory. So uh, courts, role of court is really very important when it comes to avoid ambiguity and ambiguous things. So resolving ambiguities we have courts and interpreting legal language we have courts. Aids to interpretation. So what are the aids that are provided to interpretation? Legislative history is there. Legislative histories are there where you can refer to those legislations where we can find the idea of how to understand those aspects. Like we can refer to legal precedents, we can refer to juristic writings, we can refer to generals, we can refer to articles, 
so all these legislative writings they provide us all the facts and canons of statutory uh, constructions so what are these statutory constructions when it comes to that part the laid pattern of construction the laid pattern of the construction will come in this category then we are going to, to talk about evolution of legal language how that legal language has evolved you have already seen the history you have already gone through the influences the impact and how with the passage of time the demand the demand of the time actually brought about an evolution because we saw that people from different areas are not able to approach uh, like justice for justice because they were uh, although they were having that fundamental right to justice but because of their language communication they weren't able to explain the rights they weren't able to explain the uh, you can say the injustice that was happening with them so later on when these with the demand with the passage of time and uh, the urgency of the time basically the inclusion of regional languages was there and thereafter the languages the legal language evolved with the passage of time right some parts of latin language like were skipped out some were left french revolution french uh, influence was there so let's talk about here we demanded for plain language initiatives and simplifying it so challenges in modernization is in tradition versus clarity here we have focused on tradition versus uh, clarity where we uh, talked about the notarization we talked about the notarization and and attestment attestation so whenever legal documents are there like uh, a birth certificate or maybe like uh, affidavits we have the facility of getting it notarized so that we can come up with the authenticity of that data in that condition like the tradition which is running on proves or gives some kind of like positiveness to it right so this is tradition and clarity balancing precision and accessibility now i am going to come up with one by one by telling you how these contracts will be written now let's talk about this contracts first of all in contracts we have this agreement now let's begin with the first part okay so this agreement is entered into between party a and herein referred to as the company and the party b herein after referred to as a vendor so name of the parties i told you in the beginning when when we write the contract the name of two parties who are involved right it will talk about who are involved who are involved vendor shall indemnify and hold harmless the company as against all claims arising out of the sale of the goods so vendor is taking this drafting this thing drafting contracts in legal english requires careful attention to detail clarity and precision yes we have already understood this let's talk about step by step how to do that first of all identify the parties that is party a and party b one is uh, the lender and the other one is receiver now these are two parties between whom we are going to have this contract here begin with a clear identification of the parties involved and including their legal names and address so their party a party a is the name suppose and its address party b and its address so what how are you going to draft that one the first paragraph this employment agreement agreement is made and entered into on this date suppose whatever the date is right by and between employer legal name of the company address of the company okay so these are the things full legal name employee address of the employee so whoever is employee you can write down accordingly so these are the information first of all the name and address of the employee and the name and address of the employer these things will come in the first part first paragraph step number 1 identify the parties step number 2 provide details and provide recitals 
provide recitals means include the recital section explaining the context of the purpose so what is the context and what is the purpose of drafting this contract you must talk about the purpose and the reason the purpose and the context of coming up with this agreement here in step number 2 remember so now i am just coming up with this whereas the employer is engaged in describe the business or industry is engaged in leather production right leather production and and the employee process certain skills and qualifications that the employer wishes to utilize whereas the employee desires to be employed by the employer and the employer desires to employ the employee on the terms and conditions set for in so that means a party a and party b are there for the same reason one wants to hire this person and the other wants to be hired right so this is the person like uh, which kind of uh, the task is he doing leather production so here this is a contract provide recital where you would come up with the context and purpose of this agreement okay so first step identify the parties second step you what is the context and what is the purpose of it then third one define key terms what are the key terms what are the uh, principles on which the whole contract actually depends upon now you would know about the same thing that what are the contract details or we can say the conditions key terms means the conditions on which this whole contract depends upon so let's talk about the effective date means the date of the agreement base salary means the annual salary to be paid to the employee as set forth in section 4 of this agreement yes so section 4 base salary salary like whenever we write join any company it is a agreement that we sign and then further step number 4 is specify the terms and conditions so part section 2 employee employment terms position 2.1 the employee shall be employed as job title and shall perform the duties and responsibilities so here the position and compensation two things are going to be a part of it what is the position that i am going to give and what is the compensation that i am going to give in that condition here in the compensation for the employee self services the employer shall pay the employees a base salary of suppose if i say 55000 per year that makes 7.5 lakh per year payable in regular installments in accordance with the employer's standards payroll practices so here this is the terms and conditions with which it will be renewed later on also so what you have to understand step number 4 terms and conditions and step number 5 what are the rules and regulations on which it depends and address termination and remedies like at which condition this will be terminated the same contract will be terminated or cancelled will be considered as null and void if this situation happens or occurs so what would be the resolution remedies is solution to it so termination step number 5 termination conditions of termination and conditions of resolution is there any kind of resolution to it so include provisions for termination notice period any remedies in case of breach you must know about this thing then let me tell you about this termination of cause the employer may terminate this agreement for cause upon written notice to the employee for any material breach of this agreement by the employee subject to a specified days like sub, if there are days cure period termination of cause this is the first thing and the second thing is termination by employee the employee may terminate this agreement by providing written notice to the employer with specified days notice that means before leaving the job this person is going to give the notice period or serve the notice period and give the application first and serve the notice period then only he would be able to leave so remember these are termination points also in a contract this is a live example when you write being a lawyer you all have to come up with that writing part where you will learn which type of language you can use which type of like legal terminologies and phrases you can use 
this is an important one. Then step 6 add miscellaneous provisions, if there are miscellaneous provisions yes you can talk about them include such as dispute resolution, governing law and relevant clauses. Further you can definitely talk about governing law and entire agreement. Let me read out this one, this agreement shall be governed by and construed in accordance with the laws of the state without regard to its conflicts of laws principle. An agreement is, this agreement contains the entire agreement between the parties and supersedes all prior and contemporaneous agreements, representations and understandings. So, these are additional provisional uh, provisions that you want to add in this contract. These are additional provisions or additional points that you want to add in that contract because basically you have to follow comes come with terms and conditions, additional miscellaneous uh, provisions, sometimes name and uh, uh, address of that uh, parties of the parties and further you can definitely go on with seventh that is signature and the date execution. So, here at the end on one side left hand side you will go on with the uh, person who is the employer, employer name, signature on the top and then name, full name and then date. On right hand side it would be employers, uh, employees signature, employees name and date. So, it will be like that, let us have a look over here. In witness whereof the parties here to have executed this agreement as of the effective date. So, signature of the employer, printed name of the employer, signature of the employee, employee. What is the most important thing that we write name and then on the top of it we write signature, we put our signature and then lower to it date. Many people they do not know about this thing, suppose if I say Divya Gupta. I will sign over here like this. Instead of many people say Divya, they put their name here on the top, which is absolutely wrong. Understood everyone? So, this one is entirely wrong example. This is the correct way. Further, so here till now you have understood what and how you can draft a contract in English, in especially legal English in India. Now I am going to deal with licenses, how licenses are written, how are you going to draft a legal document for license. Now in this condition this thing is, please pay attention towards this, this license grants the licensee, licensee a non-exclusive, non-transferable right to use the software as per the terms and conditions herein. So, what are the terms and conditions in this contract law? Contract as there, like all the terms and conditions in this contract, the license is granted, grants the licensee. Licensee means the person who has applied for the license. A person who has applied for the license, a non-exclusive and licensee shall comply with all applicable laws, regulations while using the licensed software. Suppose uh, there is a computer lab somewhere in your college or in your university, then uh, there is a software which is going through. Sometimes like uh, we use the software of uh, computer graphics, sometimes we use ETEL, sometimes we use ORL software. So, before that we receive this license of using this software. So, this is the particular language through which we definitely say the licensee has the right to use this software, shall comply with all applicable laws and regulations while using the licensed software. So, you must know about the language usage. Now, you should know about the indictments or subpoenas. Now, the grand jury charges the defendant with the offense of embezzlement in violation of section 420 of the Indian Penal Code. 
so he is charging the charges the defendant for this you are hereby commanded to appear in court as a witness by virtue of this subpoena so you must this is person like uh, called for the victim uh, identification or uh, the case hearing then we use briefs briefs are the document legal documents where in the matter of x y z basically versus a b c suppose there are these are two parties first party and this is the second party right in this condition the appellant contends that the trial court erred in its interpretation of section 138 of the negotiable negotiable instruments act so the respondent submits that the lower court's judgment is well founded and should be upheld so in that condition a brief is written in that in the way where the appellant contends that the trial court erred in the erred in the interpretation section 138 of the negotiable negotiable instruments act now this is a brief it would be written in such a manner understood everyone so here you can understand the logics the points that you should include in it the figures the essential uh, requirements essential requisites of writing and drafting this point this these briefs you must know about both the parties and what is the reason of it then we can talk about the judgments how these judgments are done or the verdicts come so the court after considering the evidence and the legal arguments hereby orders the defendant to pay compensation to the plaintiff in the sum of rupees 1 lakh within 30 days so this is the judgment how judgment is written judgment is written that on the basis of the court after considering the legal arguments and the witnesses you can include the evidence has decided or hereby orders the uh, the defendant to pay this much amount as a compensation to the plaintiff so here this is the language which you are going to use for judgments in accordance with article 142 in the indian constitution this judgment shall be enforceable throughout the territory of india so we have to mention the article clause article and clause under which this particular decision has been taken so remember whenever we cast any verdict whenever the judge comes up with any kind of verdict in that condition you must know that the decision has been taken according to this action according to this act according to this section according to this sub clause or this clause so this should be mentioned in it and according to article 348 this thing would be applied to each and every uh, to to throughout the territory of india now in this condition you must know that laws of parliament are also written in the same manner when it comes to laws of parliament you must know that parliament actually like the people magistrate like uh, legislative assembly members members of lok sabha vidhan sabha parishad so they actually write some points they they uh, present the bills and after that presentation they come up with some kind of like uh, suggestions so let's talk about that language let's see be it enacted by the parliament of india in the 65th year of the republic of india as follows so what is that section 2 sub section 2 clause 3 oh sorry section 2 clause 1 sub clause a of the companies act 2013 is hereby amended to read as follows the incorporated companies must file annual reports by the end of the fiscal year so this has been the kind of uh, rule that has been passed by the parliament so this is what section 2 under clause 1 sub clause a of the companies act 2013 is hereby read like that 
So, what is, the, what is the main gist of it? This one, the incorporated companies must file annual reports by the end of the fiscal year. So, this, this is the whole way, this is the whole language, this is the whole style that you have to follow. Should be followed to avoid ambiguity, to avoid ambiguity, right. So, here we are talk, going to talk about case reports. Now, in these conditions, what are these case reports? What like there are when you talk about case laws, obviously, uh, there are many landmark cases are there, there are uh, current recent cases are there and in landmark cases also like on the basis of that, we come up with the case laws, solution to that, to those case laws. Now, in this condition, how are you going to write down that case report? So, this is the way you are going to do with this. Now, in the landmark case of Keshav Nanda Bharti versus State of Kerala 1973, the Supreme Court of India held that basic structure of the constitution cannot be altered. Yes, and this has become the legal precedence for others. Legal precedence for other cases. Further, we have the judgment in Menka Gandhi versus Union of India 1978 expanded the scope of personal liberty under article 21. So, what is the decision that expanded the growth, the, the scope of personal liberty under article 21. So, this is how you are going to draft that case report. Further legal correspondence, legal correspondence like how are you going to interact or legally correspond with the judiciary. There has to be some kind of proper pattern and format to be followed and under some strict rules and regulations. So, you are going to address that person first of all like dear sir or madam because humble or you can say that address formal salutation is very much important you know formal salutation, formal salutation sometimes to whomsoever to whom so, to whom it may concern, it could be like that. Second, it could be dear sir or madam, like that means the use of titles must be there and use of honor, honor fix should be there, right. So, a normal kind of like uh, addressing should be there without that this thing would be uh, like futile basically, like you should follow some strict patterns and rules. Let us talk about this thing, we are writing to formally demand the immediate cessation of the infringing activities as detailed in our previous communities dated. So, what do you mean by immediate cessation of the infringing activities? In this condition, you must know that uh, when we talk about infringing activities, that means all the activities that are illegal and uh, you can say stopping of action, maybe that is cessation, this is cessation, okay, stopping of action and second part is infringing, infringing activities means Infringing activities means to break, to break a rule, law or agreement. So, this is what agreement. So, this is what basically is all about legal correspondence that is cessation of the infringement, infringing activities. Now, for this please find attached a notice of a default pursuant to clause 5 of the loan agreement dated on so and so. Here we will discuss about the conclusion at the end because now we have understood that how things they are done. You know very well that how everything each and every uh, legal document would be drafted in legal language of India, right. So, when I talk about the language, yes of course, there is a mode of communication, mode of like uh, the language usage. 
Supreme Court, when it talks about his own verdict, his own regulations, his own bills, etc., when it passes all those things, they come in English. English is a default language, you know. When, whenever no other language is uh, like uh, you can say assigned to it, English is used for the same. But on the contrary, like UP, Madhya Pradesh, uh, uh, like Bihar, they have fixed up that Hindi should be their, uh, their uh, official language so that to communicate with others. So every letters from UP, in, uh, with they interact with each other, they will send in Hindi. But non-native Hindi speakers, uh, non-native Hindi states and Hindi states, they basically interact in their own regional language along with the translation version, translated version of English. So, this is how your conclusion works out. Now, remember, this is the language dominance over here. Like, whenever it is in regional language, it becomes very easy for everyone to understand the things. Now, when it comes to this aspect, you must know that these examples illustrate the use of legal language in various legal documents and the importance of precise, precise, formal and clear language in Indian legal context. Secondly, you would be able to, after just uh, legal language is very crucial in, in learning the contextual language, while learning the aspects, while learning the intricacies of all these things of law effectively or you can say the obligations, some rules and regulations. So, you must actually know about all these things. Let it be the part and parcel of your drafting part. Okay? So, with this note, I think you people have understood everything. And basically, these are the books that I have referred throughout my lecture, Legal Language and Legal Writing, then Legal Language, Legal Writing, Legal Practices of 2012, then I have referred a handbook on Legal Writing, Researching and Mooting Lexis Nexis, then Legal Language and Legal Writing in Practice, Oxford University, that is long 2016 edition, then I have referred to Legal Writing and Drafting, Pearson, Plain Language Legal Writing. In order to show you the drafting, way I have taken referred these books and several others. So, please try to refer new books, try to refer them, read a lot and try to come up with some wonderful ideas of uh, learning. So, here I am Dr. Divya Gupta signing off for now my dear learners and wish you all the best if you are on the track of coming up or clearing the PCSJ exam. Yes, all these lectures are going to help you out in order to learn something new. Thank you everyone. Thanks a lot.